This episode of Blowing Smoke with Twisted Rico is brought to you by Notch Brewing in Salem, Massachusetts. Brewing and serving European-influenced beer in Notch's Beer Hall and Beer Garden on the Salem Harbor. Are you ready for this? Notch will be opening a second location in Brighton, Mass., which will also have a beer hall, a large beer garden, and check this out, an outdoor live performance and music space. You heard that right, live music. And man, are we ready for live music or what? Notch's beer is available throughout Mass and Rhode Island, through mail order in Mass and Pennsylvania. And I got to tell you, people really love this beer, Notch. It's time to get yourself a Notch, or better yet, get over to Notch Brewing. Blowing Smoke with Twisted Rico. I'm your host, Steve Ricardo. This week we have an interview with someone who has done it all, played in bands, now manages bands, someone I have a great deal of respect for, Darren Hell. Darren has played in some great bands over the years. He was in the Red Rockers, the Rain Dogs. He played in Paul Westerberg's band, and he was in the short-lived but awesome Star Darts. And then he became a manager. He became Paul Westerberg. Westerberg's manager, in fact. And then he managed the New York Dolls. He did the Dropkick Murphys, the Mighty Mighty Boss Tones, Roki Erickson, and many other artists. He also has a very successful and popular shop called the Pop Emporium, which he opened in 2012. It's kind of sad for me to do this interview now that Terry Engeron, good friend of mine who I had a relationship with, uh, passed away a few years ago, but really introduced me to all the Red Rockers. And I wish she was around to hear this interview because she would really appreciate this. So in a couple seconds, we're going to play the interview for you with Darren Hill. All right. Uh, I'm very happy to have Darren Hill on the show today. How you doing, man? I am good, Steve. <laughs> I have to tell uh, all your listeners out there that... Uh, Steve and I go way back, and uh, you know, through all his incarnations, he has been a true rock and roll soldier. <laughs> and I'm going to mention a few of those incarnations, <laughs> but first, I want to say I know you had a very busy week because you're the manager of the Mighty Mighty Boss Tones, and they had a new record come out. That's right. That's right. New record. Uh, they, the lingo they use now is dropped. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> The record dropped on Friday, last Friday. Well, I'm going to try. Uh, I'll but, try to keep it old school for. for yeah, yeah, you yeah. And I. Please. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know all the, the current lingo, but uh, this this week has also been interesting because all of a sudden it's like the lights have come back on and uh, everybody's just scrambling to book shows and you know it's 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 actually insane. My head's spinning. How how did you deal with the last like year like 14 months? Was it rough for you? It, it it was rough, but it, at the same time, it was also, um, you know, a, a good experience because I think uh, my artists used their time wisely and did what they should have been doing, which was recording a record and, and you know, getting that all ready. So let us that opportunity at least. But uh, other than that, it was it was it was a struggle, you know, particularly financially because as as a manager, you know, let's say like eighty percent of your income comes from live performances yeah as opposed to uh to royalties and sinks and all that stuff now. I, I do understand what that's like <laughs> yeah <laughs> um so i wanted to start with talking about new orleans a little bit because um although i never got to see the red rockers uh i met most of the band at different times mostly because of my relationship with terry engeron and i don't know if i ever talked to you about terry do you remember Terry? We, we did talk about Terry uh, a few times, I, I recall, and but I don't remember how you knew Terry. Well, we went out with each other <laughs> for a few okay. years, and we worked together. Unfortunately, I don't know if you know, but she passed away a few I, years I, ago. I, I do, I do. 
But if um, it wasn't for her, I wouldn't have met. Uh, first of all, when I w- when we were going out and we were hanging out in uh, California in L.A., she dragged me down to this bar in Venice where all the New Orleans Saints fans were hanging out every week. So I get there and I'm expect I'm thinking, all right, well, you know, I can hang out with jocks and whatever. I get there and there's all these rock dudes, and the first person <laughs> I meet is James Singletary, and I'm like. Wait a second. You're you're from the Red Rockers, right? And then I met all these other guys. And then later on, I went down in New Orleans and I met John at the uh, Howlin' Wolf. And, you know, and we hung around at Jimmy's and Carrollton Station and all those places. And oh, then our la- old haunt. Yeah, and yep. then later Terry went on the road with uh, Cowboy Mouth, so I got to see John again, but... I had to mention that. So, you know, the Red Rockers, you know, you guys had a really nice run for like six years or so. It started with 415 and, uh, you know, Columbia. I mean, I remember when I was in college radio and Dead Heroes came out and it was on that Rodney and the Rock compilation. Can you go back there and tell us what that was all like, how it was growing up in New Orleans and how it led to you being a Red Rocker? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so John and James and I all lived in the same neighborhood, and uh, we we all got turned on to, uh, I guess you know the best description would be punk rock uh, while we were in high school, and bonded over that. And one day we decided we were going to start a band, so we started, you know, learning instruments and rehearsing in in John's parents' garage in this. Uh, suburban neighborhood of new orleans and um you you can say the town i might know it it wasn't like metairie or kenner or something was it algiers which is directly (laughs) across the river yeah Yeah, but i I went to to high school in uh uptown at at a high school named called ben franklin where uh went marcellus and a bunch of other people also attended and uh had to take the uh you know if i didn't take a, a car or a bus across the bridge, we would go to school via um, the, the riverboat ferry. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty wild. Yeah. So, you so got, we started uh, playing ahead. around New Orleans and, uh, you know, started started gaining some momentum. Our, our first uh, really big show, we, we landed a chance to open for the Cramps when they came to New Orleans for the first time. This would have been 1979, I think. And then we did uh, we did uh, some dates with the Clash and the Dead Boys, and at a certain point, I realized that if we were going to make it any further, we had we had to move somewhere else because New Orleans was sort of an isolated, like an island, uh, musically a, a good island, no be it, but um, it just you know our, our style of music just didn't quite fit in there, so. I tricked all the guys. I told them I had some shows booked in California. So we loaded up everything into a, a, a rental truck and literally just moved out to L.A. And we floundered around for a while out there. Um, but unfortunately, our drummer, uh, he was still 17 at the time, and his parents made him come home. So here, here's the story of how, how we Jim landed Riley. our first... <laughs> well, he, this is even pre-Jim Riley. Okay. So this is Patrick Jones who played right. on, on condition red. So I, I, I had become, fr- we opened for X in new Orleans. So I was friends with John Doe and I, I, I called him up to see if he knew of any drummers that could help us out. Cause we finally did have some shows booked in LA. Um, this was back in the days of, of answering services as opposed <laughs> to answering machines. So our, our future drummer was answering the phones for an answering service for John and, you know, I told, I left the message, uh, you know, so Darren Hill from Red Rockers and um, wondering if you know any drummers, blah, 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 blah. So, so the, the guy answering the phone says, hey, I'm a drummer. Can I come try out? <laughs> so he did. And, and it, he was perfect. So, so that worked out for a few years. And then uh, cut to probably about a year later after we were signed to 415 Records. Um, we ended up kicking Patrick out of, out of the, uh, out of the band, long story that ended in a fist fight, but, uh, (laughs) um, Howie Klein, who ran 415 records, 
said, hey, I just ran into to Bono, and Bono knows uh, this drummer who was in Stiff Little Fingers and is looking, just moved to America and is looking for a gig, and I thought he'd be perfect for you guys. And, and you know, my jaw just dropped because I was a huge Stiff Little Fingers fan. So we uh, we called up Jim and, and got him on a plane to New Orleans, and uh, and that was it. Wow. See, I didn't know there was a third drummer. I always thought Patrick was the first drummer and then Jim Riley took over for him. So I just learned something because yeah, there you go. Patrick played on the condition red record, which by the way is a classic album. And you know, anyone that I'm sure anyone that's familiar with American punk rock has heard that record. And I mentioned dead heroes before uh, you guys started to change after that. And uh, the good is gold record well, you, you actually had a hit single on it, China. And then you really started touring the U.S. I mean, what, what was that whole period like for you? That, that was insane. We did, we did so many amazing tours, you know, with the, with the Go-Go's and uh, Minute Work and Joan Jett and U2 and, you know, on and on and on. It, was, it seemed like constant touring. And... Uh, by, by this time, we were signed to Columbia Records, and, you know, they, they were putting a lot of money behind us, and they hired Annie Leibovitz to do our wow. album cover, nice. and, uh, you know, we, we ended up with, like, number one alternative uh, track on radio, and, uh, you know, charted with, with China, and, uh, yeah, that was, uh, th- th- those were just amazing, amazing times. Every time I get depressed, I just sort of think back as to, you know, what a wonderful adventure I've had. So I didn't know you guys toured with the Go-Go's. I have to ask you about that. Did you do like a national tour with them? Yeah, we did. We did, actually. That must have been something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just, uh, I just posted, posted some pictures on Facebook, actually, in honor of their induction to the uh, Hall of Fame. Yeah, yeah. Uh, were you a little disappointed that the New York Dolls missed the cut? I was going to ask. You I about was, that later. but I, I expected that. You know, the, the replacements and the New York Dolls. Yeah, they man, missed all bands I've worked yeah. with have both been nominated but never elected, and uh, you know, it's sad. But who knows? One day, maybe. Like the Red Rockers went through like a pretty drastic change by the time the uh, Schizophrenic Circus record came. I have to ask you this. Yeah, I'm, I'm not. I'm not trying to embarrass you or anything. But no, 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 no. Did you also hate the cover, or did? Oh God, yeah. <laughs> I, I, uh, I I almost quit the band. Uh, we fired our manager. Uh, it, it was it was a colossal mistake that that just got out of control. It's supposed to be a, a photo that was going to be on a little tiny flyer lying on the beach, and you couldn't really tell what it was. But the art director. At Columbia decided she loved the Ugh. picture so much that she had to put it on the cover. And by the time we, we found out it was it was too late, we were able to to change it for the um, European and UK releases. But uh, God, I, I I thought I'd track down just about every copy and burned them, but there's still a few out there, I guess. So way back, I know that must have been rough because I oh, I, I was just looking at the cover again. I revisited and, and it. Just, so not reflective of the music either. So it was just it was it was terrible. Do you still keep in touch with the guys in the band from that era? Absolutely. And uh, this year actually marks uh, the 40th anniversary wow. of Condition Red. So we're working on a on a reissue because it's been out of print since uh, you know 1981. So we're working on that, and I we've managed to locate. Um, some unreleased tracks from that period, and it's it's going to be kind of fun doing this. Yeah, we'll, well hopefully culminate in doing a show because everybody's still alive and able to walk right now. So, <laughs> okay, that would really be something if you guys did a show together. So, if you talk to James too, oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. James yeah. and I got to know each other fairly well. I checked out some of his LA bands. He was out there for a while trying to get things going. Yep. And John's a great guy, man. You know, you were in a band with some pretty cool people, so... Well, you know, I always draw the analogy of, of, you know, it's like being in war. You know, your first bandmates, they're just, you know, it's a bond that you can never, never shake, you know? It's your brothers, and uh, I love that. 
I mean, to this day, if I had to, you know, name my, my two best friends, it would be James and John, you know? That's fantastic, man. I'm happy I met the, both of those guys. I remember going on the uh, Cowboy Mouth tour bus, and, you know, I was talking to John about the Red Rockers and you, because I had met you at that time, you know, I'd already known you from the yeah. Star Darts and stuff, or the Rain Dogs even. And, you know, yeah. he was all excited to talk. They played the show at a private Harvard show for a hundred guys in suits in the Harvard club. And I was there because Terry, Terry was like tour managing them on that tour. And she said, you want to come? And I went, it was like me and a hundred guys in the band and Terry, it was crazy. They got great. A lot of money from that show from what I heard, but (laughs) (laughs) I I have to uh, digress and tell you a little story about Terry. So there was a rival band that uh, was called the Dukes in New Orleans. Yeah. And they were more new wave than punk. And their fans, um, they had a lot of girl fans because they were, you know, good looking dudes and whatnot. Their fans were called, their girls were called Beat Girls. <laughs> we actually had a song called Beat Girl, but Terry was like the number one Beat Girl. So uh, <laughs> that sounds like my Terry, man. Yeah. <laughs> I really miss her, man. I actually get tears in my eyes when I think about her. We, you know, we had the last time I saw her, she had, we were both in LA around 2007 living out there, but I went down to New Orleans after Katrina and I helped her move out of her destroyed place. And uh. it was, I remember going into that airport, nobody was at the airport. And then I, she picked me up and like, it was the saddest thing I ever saw, because I love New Orleans. I'm sure you experienced the same thing oh, me after too. that. You know what sucks, too, is we, we were um, slated to, to play um, the Voodoo Fest that year, and it was, it was going to happen like right after Katrina, so they canceled it, and um, they ended up doing like a weird version of it in Ottoman Park later on that year that I had the, the New York Dolls on, but uh, the Red Rockers didn't, didn't play on that one it was still too messed up Uh, yeah new orleans has gone through some rough shit so um yeah but they're resilient yeah i love people from new orleans man i really do i just i do i've met so many cool people from down there and i loved hanging out down there and every time i was on the road with bands when i worked at a&m and i was in new orleans i would go see terry and i would go to the holland wolf and all those cool bars down there because it's just yep yeah tipitina's of course i was with a few bands there what a great place so you know you moved to boston after the red rockers and you ended up in another pretty well-known band the rain dogs how did you decide to move to boston or with the red rockers were done at that point correct no we were we were still going in fact we had just finished um the uh unforgettable fire tour with you too and we, we kind of, I forgot where the last date was, but it was pretty close to Boston. So we decided after that tour, we were going to go to uh, Boston and kind of hang out for a little bit before we went back to New Orleans. But after we got here, uh, after a little while, we realized, like, maybe we should, maybe we should move to Boston. Because in New Orleans, um, just geographically, there, there are no other... Um, right major markets anywhere close so if you're trying to survive during like an album cycle when you're when you're writing new music and stuff like that you just you can't do it you got to go literally go on the road you can't just pop out for a weekend or whatever whereas in boston um you know you got the whole eastern seaboard and and so many colleges too which we were playing a lot of college dates uh, WBCN had always been really supportive of us, and we had a lot of friends up in Boston. So it just seemed like a good move for us. So we hunkered down, uh, eventually got called back to do more dates, another leg with U2, and uh, started writing our next record. And then that, that's kind of when things went south. I think um, a lot of the guys missed their girlfriends back in New Orleans and, and whatnot. And we just kind of threw in the towel. Jim Riley, our drummer, yes. and myself stayed in Boston, and um, we decided to start a new band, and we hooked up with an Irish, uh, actually Scottish, uh, fiddle player who is world-renowned named Johnny Cunningham. He was in a band called Silly Wizard over in Scotland that were really big in like the folk scene. 
but he wanted to do some rock stuff. So we had this concept in mind of sort of melding, uh, I guess what you would call Americana music with, with Celtic music, mm-hmm. uh, you know, before anybody else was doing it. And eventually we hooked up with Mark Cutler from the Schemers out of Providence, Rhode Island, mm-hmm. and he became our, our singer, and the guitar player from the Schemers also joined the band, and, and we were complete, and we got signed to uh, Atco Records and uh, put out a couple of records, and we did some amazing tours with that band as well. Did Bob Dylan and the Water Boys and Don Henley. Dude, and, you've toured uh, with everybody, Warren man. Warren <laughs> yeah. Man. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember the Rain Dogs, great band, and I know you guys were um, inducted into the Rhode Island Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which is awesome. That's right. I was yep. happy when I heard about that. It was a few years ago, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> not to, I mean, I love you know the Rain Dogs. I got to see maybe once or twice. Really, really good band. And then you know when that. You have so much stuff, Darren, that I gotta keep. I got I can't. I could spend a <laughs> whole a show. Right yeah. yeah, but you know, I remember when I saw you, and I actually got to know you a little better when I was in Cambridge for some outdoor music thing in Minahan, because I had worked with the neighborhoods for a long time. I had a new band, the Star Darts. So mm-hmm. I went and I saw you guys. You played some outdoor thing in Cambridge, and we we spoke that day and. Another one of our friends, Alan Devine, who passed away recently, was yeah. in the Star Darts. And that band was a really cool band. You guys only had basically one single, right? Yeah, we've, we've recorded pretty much an entire record that uh, I think Dave's going to start mixing at some point. You're we kidding like me. It. No. An unreleased no, Star really Darts good. record? Wow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, that'll be popular around here, I'll tell you. We're in Somerville right now. So, I mean, I know that'll be popular around here because everything... There you go. Yeah. So, so the Start Arts were an outgrowth of the Paul Westerberg experience. So, David and I both tried out for Paul Westerberg's, from the replacements, of course, his first solo band for his 14 songs tour. And uh, we went down to New York and, and tried out in separate auditions, uh, but we ended up making it. And, uh, you know, we did that entire tour with, with Paul, Josh Fries on drums. You were on Saturday and, Night Live? <laughs> yeah, we did Saturday Night Live, Jules Holland. We, you know, toured, you know, Europe, the U.S. twice. It was It was just an amazing experience getting to play those replacement songs and Paul's solo stuff. Night I, after night, just totally amazing. I got my timeline we, a little mixed up there. Sorry, I, I put no, the no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. When we finished that, Dave and I said, oh, "Let's start our own band." So that's how how the Star Darts were born. Yeah, I was really that cool band. I was going to talk about Westerberg next because uh, everyone remembers that Saturday Saturday Night Live show that you guys did, <laughs> and uh, you know uh, you were touring like on the fourteen songs record, right? Correct. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and so that's when you and Paul started your relationship, pretty much, and now you're his manager still, that's right? right? It's been 1993, and I started managing him about 1999, I guess. Wow, that's really good, After, man. after releasing uh, a side project of his on a little label I had out of Boston. Uh, I, Monolith. Yes, I remember that. Monolith Records. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I want to talk about your management, but I'm not going to leave Clover out of the conversation. I can't. <laughs> because, uh, you know, I was in San Diego. I don't even know if you remember this. We were all at this polygram. That was convention. the convention, right? Yep. At that hotel? Uh, yeah, I was hanging out with you guys. I was, I, you, you were, you, I know I hung out with you for a little while, but I was mostly with Doherty and Mike Stone. And, you know, we were, we were like at, at some bar probably. And, um, it, I just think it's f- fantastic that you three guys were in a band together. And Brian, the drummer, also has a great history. Clover got signed, too. Man, you have been signed to a lot of major labels. It makes, yeah, that was Mercury Records. Yeah. Pretty cool. It makes sense to me that you became a su- successful manager because you were on both sides of the aisle, so you understood how it went. Clover kind of like was a tough I mean, for, for Mercury, they didn't seem like they knew what they, to do with the band. I hate to throw them under the bus, but... Yeah, I, yeah, no, no, you're correct. 
But it must have been fun playing with Chris Doherty. Chris is going to be on my oh, show next Chris. week. Yeah, and it's Mike Stone ends up in Queensryche. That was I pretty- know. <laughs> <laughs> How did you end up with those guys? Well, Chris and I have been friends forever, so uh, you know we were really, really close. Um, I don't know where Chris found Mike. It's that I'll have to ask him one day how that went down because. Mike was sort of a rock and roll chameleon, so I think Chris w- was pretty influential in, in molding him in, into what he was for, for Clover. Very talented guy, though. Yeah, I was really surprised at first when I heard he was in uh, Queensryche, and then I listened to Operation Mind Crime 2, and he co-wrote all the songs. You know, and I was like, wow, he really has his imprint on this band and then he, you know, toured with them, but I haven't heard much from him lately. That was a the few last years ago. I heard from him. He had like this jazz combo he, he was doing. He's all over the place. man. <laughs> I know. Right. <laughs> so, I mean, was it after that whole experience that you started up uh, 10 pin management? Yeah, that was it. By, by that time I, um, I had started a family. My son was born. I said, shit, man, I got to get off the road. I got to get a real job. But, you know, I started looking around. I was like, what else? What am I going to do? You know, <laughs> I don't know if I know how to do anything else because I've been in the music business my entire life. So the logical choice seemed to be to go into management because, as you mentioned, I've been on, you know, the other side of the aisle there and made every mistake in the book. But I also learned from those mistakes. And I, I must have had an inkling that I was going to do that eventually because I, I was very careful to network as much as I could when I was playing in bands and uh, observe and learn as I went along. So all that experience really, really helped me when I started my management company. And I think also, um, you know, the, the, the artists that I was working with, they, they appreciated the fact that I had been a guy in the van and I knew you know, what it was like on the other side. So, you know, there's a lot of, lot of trust there. Yeah, and you managed to draw Pick Murphy's when Rick was still in the band, and, you know, I used to work with the Outlaws. Yeah, we have, Rick and Mike McColgan. Yeah, yep. we, we have so many connections with all your bands, it's weird. <laughs> I was going through the list, and I'm like, wow, we are connected in so many different ways. It's like, and I, you also had the Royal Crowns, weren't they one of your yeah, first yeah, bands? Yeah, yeah, those were my two first bands. Um, the Royal Crowns and um, Dropkick Murphys, approximately the same time. And so, yeah, they, the Crowns w- ended up, uh, they won the, the BCN Rumble yeah. and went on to uh, to get signed to Walter Yetnikoff's label, Velvel. And, uh, yeah, they had a good run. And the Dropkick and, Murphys have done okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think they they, they might have a chance. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so that was six years I worked with them. Wow, and, that's a uh, good lo- run. Yeah, I love those guys. Um, they were hard, six hard years though. <laughs> it's tough uh, uh, getting a, a band to a certain certain point. Yeah, well, you know, management's not easy, man. You know, believe me, no. I, I I get it, I understand. Uh, uh, the New York Dolls must have been a special time for you, and I was lucky because. I was managing the Charms, and they ended up going on the road with the Dolls for like 22 shows or something. And they did that New Year's Eve thing. I remember yeah, seeing you. Yeah, Little Stevens. Yeah, I, Grand Garage. Yeah, I remember hanging out with you a little bit on New Year's Eve. I met mm-hmm. Joe Hansen. Well, I met him a long time ago when he was in the David Joe Hansen band, and he came to Framingham State University when I was there. But it was, wow. it was cool seeing him again. And <laughs> Sylvain, I booked a couple shows for when he came to Boston with his solo thing. But those doll shows, I saw, like, I can remember Cleveland, Detroit, Atlanta, and uh, Nashville. And one other one. I can't remember the other one. But I saw, like, five shows. New York. And they were amazing, man. And you were totally involved in that whole thing. The Underground Garage Festival, too. I forgot about that. Oh, that was yeah, huge. boy. I think I look back at the lineup on that day, and that was insane. Yeah, I think the Dolls played next to last before the Stooges, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was an, um, yeah. Bo Diddley. I remember <laughs> sitting back with Bo Diddley. Yeah. His trailer was right right across from ours. And, uh, you know, 
big star. I mean, Alex Chilton and I were roommates down in New Orleans, so it was great to really? have him there. Yeah. Wow, that's cool. I never knew that. That, that must have meant something. He's considered an icon as far as American songwriters go. Absolutely. And deservedly so. Westerberg liked him, too. A little joke. Oh, there, yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. Wrote a little song about him. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, the doll thing was, was amazing. It was, uh, you know, I started working with Dave, with uh, David first. I was managing him for a couple of years. And then um, out of the blue, I got a call from, from Morrissey, of all people, who said he was curating this festival in London called The Meltdown. And was there any chance I could get the dolls to, to reform to do it? And uh, somehow we pulled it off. Wow. Well, you know, Scarpati's a good friend of mine, too. He shot the cover, John Scarpati. Yeah. Yeah. So oh, that, man, that's such a great cover. Yeah I, yeah, I know he told me that Sylvain, Sylvain, rest in peace once again. How many times do we have to do this in one show, man? It's kind of sad, but I, I remember he told me that Sylvain was giving him a hard time because he was standing in the back, and he's like, I want to stand closer to the front. <laughs> when he told me that story, I loved it, man. Scar party. Poor Phil. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I, I got a couple more things for you. This might be one of the best things of all, the replacements reunion. And you get Minahan to join the band. Now that, and I had, you actually got me on the guest list because the show was sold out in Pittsburgh. And the day before the show got canceled. And I was yeah. like, Paul hurt his back. I know he was going yep. through that tour with a bad back. But the replacements thing, talk about that a little bit, man. Oh, yeah. Well, that that was something that I never thought would ever happen. And, um, you know, we, we were constantly getting offers for Coachella and all these other things, like insane money. And I don't know how this ended up happening, but, uh, you know, the, the, I don't know if you're familiar with the Riot Fest. Yes. Um, so they were doing uh, three shows that year, uh, one in Chicago, one in Toronto, and one in Denver, Denver. of all places. Yep. So they made us an insane offer, and I was able to sell it to Paul and Tommy because this was like an independent festival, not associated with any of the you know Live Nation or big promoters or whatnot. And they just felt like the time was right for it. The timing was, was perfect. If they were ever going to do it, this should be it. And uh, I think they just wanted uh, to give some closure to the legacy as well. So we did it and uh, had so much fun that we just continued the reunion tour for about a year and a half, actually. Yeah. Did some dates in Europe and uh, you know throughout the States. And it was so much fun. How did Minahan get in, involved in the whole thing? Because I know we had a relationship with Paul and you, but it was, was it an obvious choice for you guys? Yeah, and, and, and particularly for, for Paul, because he felt comfortable with David having played with him before. So it was essentially the same band that I was in for Paul's solo tour, uh, only Tommy playing bass instead of me. Because Josh Freeze was on yes. drums for, for both of those. Boy, that so guy's in Paul, the studio so much, I'm surprised you got him to do a whole tour. <laughs> I know, I know. No, but but Josh, I mean, yeah, talk about a kid that, I mean, he's, he's not a kid anymore, but he was when he was playing with us. Uh, I mean, he plays with Nine Inch Nails and Perfect and, you know, Glenn Campbell and you name it. He's done it. Sting, you know. But, yeah, we, we were able to talk him into it. I mean, we didn't even have to because he, he's – number one replacements fan so it was perfect yeah that was and, it, and they knew all the songs it was, yeah it was very very comfortable and easy for paul to do it that way as opposed to starting with you know two guys that he hadn't played with before so um i gotta ask you i mean this paul what's what's paul's plans for the future because i know you guys are still working together pretty much right yeah, but he he's essentially retired. He's wow. he decided he's not never going to uh perform again. Um you know, maybe doing a little songwriting here and there, but uh you know, he's he's kind of done with it. And uh I, I respect that. Yeah, yeah, we all do because he's a legend. I re I'll never forget the early 80s, you know, especially 84 Let It Be. That record was just <sighs> 
My God. Yeah, and they had such a connection to Boston too. Yeah. So you must have. Yeah. Absolutely. So you know now you the the Boston's are like you know I mean it's I mean you, you, didn't you used to work with them and then they took a hiatus and then they you, you're back with them now is that or or have you been with them all along th- through a hiatus? Uh, I started working with them during the hiatus, and um, gosh, I can't I, I can't even the the two thousand and seem like a blur to me, so I can't even pinpoint the date. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I was always very uh, entrenched in that camp, very close to those guys. They were all my friends, and uh, since we moved to Boston, in fact, um, in, in 85. So uh, I've known them since the beginning. And, you know, for their, one of their biggest tours would have been uh, 97 on uh, – you know, when they had Impression out and that, that let's face it, record. Um, so they, they the tour was called Boston on the Road. So they, they took two of my bands out with them, um, the Dropkick Murphys and the Royal Crown. That was a great tour. Yeah, that was really cool and uh, good for them doing that. So, yeah, they called me up, uh, you know, during the hiatus to just kind of mind their business for them and then got back together and... Um, you know, here we are. Yeah, and the, the, you know, Going I'm sure strong. this is going to be a successful record too. And you know, if I, if I, before I talk about the Pop Emporium, if I don't mention Rocky Erickson, someone will say you didn't mention Rocky Erickson. Yes, yes. I have it's to. actually Rocky. Um, <laughs> people always say Rocky, but it's Rocky. Really? Um, wow, yeah. I've been calling him Rocky forever. <laughs> <laughs> Well, not since the 13th floor elevators, but I don't know if I was even born then. Yeah, but, a lot of people do, but, you know, if you, you ask him, that's what, really how he would pronounce it. So another uh, R.I.P., you know, yeah, probably one of the most uh, wonderful human beings I've ever had the experience to share time with, i got to tell you. And what a, what a crazy history he has had. If anybody's seen the uh, documentary about him, You're Gonna Miss Me, you'll understand. <laughs> Yeah, he's he's a legend, man. You've ha- you've worked with some pretty amazing people, man. I mean, you should be proud of everything that you've done coming from like, you know, I was going to say Algiers, but I don't know if that's yes, exactly yes, the yes. name. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Alex- I, I got to <laughs> Go ahead. I got to tell you it's it's been so rewarding, not necessarily financially, but just, you know, I I feel like uh you know, I, I, I can go to rock and roll heaven now, you know. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, so so I have not yet been to the Pop Emporium, but so many people talk about that place. I've got to get my ass down to Providence and check it out. Are you guys fully open now? Did you stay open during the pandemic? We, we were closed for a while. We opened back up uh, probably about seven, six, seven months ago, just on weekends, Saturday and Sunday. But uh, we, we haven't gotten back to doing shows yet, and I'm not sure when that's going to be. But we had some pretty amazing shows in our gallery down there. David Johansson played there once, Yeah, right? we have David yeah. Johansson. That was our first one. We've had uh, Richard Lloyd from television, wow. John Doe, um, The Upper Crust, uh, Ted Leo, uh, on and on and on. That is yeah, an impressive of list. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Darren, thanks a lot, man, for taking the time to come on the show. And, you know, I want to wish you the best of luck with your management company, with Pop Emporium and whatever you do. You're a great guy. I've always admired you. We don't get to see each other very often, but I, you're, I always think about you, man, because being a manager is not easy. And I know that you, you know. <laughs> probably had to deal with a lot of shit. And, but your yep. music career, too, is fantastic. So thank you, man, well, for coming on well, the show. Well, thank you, Steve. Love it. All right, thank man. You. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks, man. Okay. Bye. She's coming around again.
Okay, I want to tell you one more time about Notch Brewing. Their beer is so good that you have to check it out. Notch Brewing is located in Salem, Massachusetts, where they're brewing and serving European-influenced beer in Notch's Beer Hall and Beer Garden on the Salem Harbor. And the good news is they have a new location opening in Brighton, Mass., which for all you out-of-towners is right next to Austin. And you probably still don't know what I'm talking about, but this is all part of Boston, basically. So the new Notch location will also have a beer hall, a large beer garden, and check this out, an outdoor live performance and music space. You heard that right. Live music is coming back, and we're ready for it. I know I am. Uh, Notch's beer is available through Mass in Rhode Island and through mail order in PA and MA. That's Pennsylvania or Massachusetts. Got to tell you, people love this beer, Notch. It's time to join the Notch Rock and Roll Club and get in on the action. All right, that was a great interview that we had with Darren Hill. And I want to mention right after the interview, we played a little music. It was the Guts Let It Go, my good friend, Jeff Palmer, who I used to refer to, and I still refer to as Jeff Useless. And that's from the self-titled album, Let It Go. Uh, Just to say a couple more words about Darren Hill, great guy. He's done it all. I mean, I couldn't even believe the list of bands that he said he toured with. I'm like, oh my God, you toured with all those bands? And, you know, it makes sense that somebody could go on the road and be in a band, be in a van, you know, do that whole thing, come from New Orleans and like, you know, move to Boston. And now he's got this great store down in Providence, the Pop Emporium, and he's managing bands, and he's man- he's been involved in some iconic situations. I mean, the Replacements Reunion Tour, the New York Dolls Reunion Tour. It's just a great interview. It was great having him on. And I'm so happy that I, we were able to talk about Terry Engeron because Terry, uh, you know, rest in peace, loved music, just about as much as anyone I've ever met in my life. So, matter of fact, we're going to dedicate this whole show to her in her honor. All right. If you want to support this podcast, check out our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Twisted Rico. If you want to reach out to me, I'm easy to find, twistedrico at gmail.com, at Twisted Rico on Instagram. We also have at Blowing Smoke with TR. There's Facebook, there's Twitter. We're everywhere. There's also a YouTube page, Blowing Smoke with Twisted Rico YouTube page. Please subscribe to it. Hit that like button. I want to thank Mike Nash here at Voice Motel in Somerville, Mass. for recording the show. Until the next time we say goodbye, this is Blowing Smoke with Twisted Rico. I'm your host, Steve Ricardo. Keep the rock and roll alive. Ten.